Hello and welcome. Recently, Matt, a member of German DOS Reloaded TDE community, got a Super Socket 7 mainboard, which turned out to be dead. Matt himself is a very experienced retro hardware enthusiast and technician, but he had no time and interest in that board, so he offered it to me. I decided to accept because, in my opinion, that board absolutely deserves to be rescued. So Matt was so nice to send it over to me and today I would like to take a look and see if I can convince it to push the bits again. As you see, the board is the famous ASUS P5A in revision 1.04. It could be important today because this board had many revisions and the earlier ones were actually better. Maybe we can come back to it later. Well, as I said, this is a SuperSocket 7 mainboard which is based on the ALI M1541 chipset by Acer, better known under the name Aladdin 5. It supports the usual SuperSocket 7 features like front side bus at 100 MHz, AGP and SDRAM. This board can accept three memory modules, each up to 256 MB. Though, as you can see, one slot has a missing lever, but that's nothing critical, you don't really need those. Well, before moving forward, one nice detail worth mentioning. As I experimented during the development of my Socket 7 voltage regulator module, I was not careful for a second and unfortunately killed my AMD K6250. I shared my sadness on the DOS Reloaded DE forum back then and Matt was so kind to remember it and sent me along with this board another K62450 as replacement for the one I destroyed. So big thanks to Matt at this point and a note on myself, don't try to run a K62 at 3.3 volts, it could take a bad end. This CPU for example is designed for 2.2 volts, some K62 require 2.4 volts, but over volting it by 1 volt is just too much. So back to the board, what's wrong with it? Matt told me that it shows some minimal signs of life, namely it shows C0 post arrow code and stops. Matt also said that this board has some signs of oxidation on the traces, and indeed when I look around the north bridge I can see some tainted traces. With oxidation going on the board it's not a good idea to power on the hardware since voltage can increase the corrosion. That's why we should first remove the corrosion as much as possible and then see what we get. Time to get out the microscope. So this is the north bridge. Yeah, and look at that gunk around it. There is a lot of dirt soaked with moisture. All the places with exposed solder or copper are showing signs of corrosion. Look at this pad on the brim around the chip. That looks bad. The question is, where did this come from? Usually such an oxidation happens due to a leaky battery or capacitors which spill the electrolyte all over the place. But in this case, neither there is a battery nearby nor any capacitors which could cause this. Most probably this board was just exposed to the elements for a longer period of time and this corrosion could come from the moisture. It could also be stashed under another mainboard which actually had leaky capacitors or battery from which the electrolyte dripped onto this board. It could be of course also an acid from whoever knows where, hard to tell. Still, it would be helpful to know what it was, but I have no litmus at hand or any other chemicals to make a check, so I'll just use white vinegar to scrub the oxidation from the corroded traces as usually. I don't know what was the reason for this corrosion and if it was an acid, vinegar will not help to neutralize it, but I will hope that it was just water or some base. Eventually, I will thoroughly wash the board with soap, water and IPA anyway. This copper pad is heavily corroded, but it is, I think, more of a design element, maybe a part of the ground plane. It should not be critical. Let's just hope that the corrosion didn't go too deep into the chip. Let's clean it with a bit of alcohol.
Yeah, the traces have to be polished. As you see, there are many contact pads exposed here and there on the traces. They are needed for failure investigation to measure signals. Unfortunately, the corrosion found its way under the solder mask through those tiny contact pads and went from there. And some traces corroded under the north bridge and I will not be able to clean those. Let's just hope that it's not as bad. Okay, before I continue with the traces, I will need to wash the board. There is just too much dirt everywhere, so I can't see the actual damage. I didn't record how I washed the PCB, just made one photo, but I used just a tap water and soap, like I did many times before and showed it already on the channel. I cleaned the board using a brush and soap, let it soak for a while and then washed everything properly with clean water. After that I used compressed air to blow out the water and left it drying for a day. Time to remove the corrosion with an engraving tool. I use some IPA again to clean the area. Unfortunately, now where the board is cleaner, I saw that the area around the south bridge is also affected by corrosion. Also, the area around the south bridge turned out to be in a very bad shape. Previously it was covered with dirt, now it's also visible how much corrosion is going on here. Let's clean it with some alcohol and a drop of white vinegar again. This is a resistor network which sits on the traces between the south bridge and the IDE connector. It also looks very affected. So I checked all the traces and despite that they look very ugly now, the good news is that they all seem to be intact. Uh, at least the traces which I cleaned seem all to still have continuity. Of course, I don't know what happens under the BGA north and south bridge, but at least everything what is exposed should be fine though I will tin and enforce the traces later. Now where at least visible corrosion has been cleaned, let's give it a first test and see what happens. I will try the CPU which Matt has sent together with his board. Hope it's fine. The pins seem to be bent. If the pins are bent just a little bit, the easiest way to get them in row is to use a ruler like this one. Much better. I set the jumpers to 2.2 volts, FSB to 100 megahertz, and multiply to 4.5. I will of course need the post analyzer card to see if this board is alive at all. If you remember, Matt told me that it stops at error code C0 right after the power on. Oh, and we will need power button and a PC speaker in case there will be some beep codes. I will also add a battery, some boards don't work properly without it.
And just as Matt reported, we are getting C0 postcode. I believe on award bars that means memory controller initialization. That happens even before memory detection and we hear no beep codes, which should happen if the error is because of the missing memory. Though let's give it a memory module and see if something changes. Same issue. Let's try another memory slot, just in case. Nope, that didn't change anything. There has to be something else. First of all, let's check the voltages. The CPU gets 2.2 volts as required. Looks like the memory and I.O. are powered by the same circuit. Three point five volts is also fine. So I double checked all the traces once again and they are still fine, but I took a closer look at the back of the PCB and found this nasty scratch there. Under the microscope it looks quite impressive, but without magnification it is actually tiny. Do you see the black circle around? I drew it using a thin 0.5mm marker, just to give you an idea. The traces are like 0.1 to 0.2mm. Anyway, as you see, the scratch crosses multiple traces. This and this seem to be still ok, though I'll have to check those as well. But these two traces are most definitely cut through. Let's remove some solder mask to check. Yes, clearly there is no continuity. And these two look fine. Let's repair the broken traces then. Ok, let's give it another try. And yay, now it demands the memory, nice. Let's add a module and see what happens. One long and three short bips. That means missing graphics card, looks good so far. Time to install the CPU cooler graphics card and the compact flash to IDE adapter. Who knows, maybe it will be already able to boot. The good news is that we have an image. The bad news is that the hard drive, or better to say compact flash card was not detected. And the keyboard too. Let's add some deoxide and give it another try. Nope, same problems. The CPU is also detected as 300 MHz. I'll have to double check the jumpers. Yes, I mix the jumper positions and put them the other way around. That explains those 300 MHz. Let's fix that first. Now to the keyboard and the IDE issue. Let's check first if the keyboard connector is OK. I will use a piece of wire to check the continuity. Everything looks fine. We also have 5 volts when the system is turned on, and the LEDs in the keyboard light up briefly. That means it gets the power. 
I checked the traces from the keyboard connector and they seem to be fine. The right two traces are the data and clock signals from the keyboard and both are going each through an inductor under this resistor network into this one from where the traces are going all over the board right into the south bridge where the keyboard controller is located. Currently I have no clue what is going on. The only suspicion so far that there is something wrong with the south bridge since IDE ports are also hanging on the south bridge and are not working Maybe those keyboard and IDE detection issues are related. So let's take a look at the disk detection issue first. As I already showed in another video about the ASUS Cubix E board, the IDE port is usually connected to the south bridge through a resistor network. So if IDE is not working, that means that either the south bridge is bad or the resistors. In this case, we have clear suspect. There was a lot of corrosion going on around the mentioned resistor networks, let's check the resistance. Here seems to be no continuity at all. No, on all four resistors there is nothing. That could be already something. Let's uh, see what we have here. I read 3 kilo ohm. The resistor says it's 4.7 kilo ohm, so since I measure in circuits, a value below 4.7 kilo ohm could be right. If you measure a resistor in circuit, the resistance should be less or equal from what the part says. Um, if the measured resistance is higher, the resistor is definitely dead. And this one seems to be dead indeed, since it shows unlimited resistance. Uh, let's reflow the solder briefly and try again. Maybe I can't measure anything because of the deep oxidation of the solder joints. Nope, still nothing. Let's replace it then. The 270 on the resistor network means 27 ohm. First two numbers are the value and the third one is the amount of zeros. So we have 27 with no zeros, which means 27 ohms. For example, 271 would mean 27 with one zero or 270 ohms and so on. Unfortunately, I have no 27 ohm resistor network at hand, but I have 22 ohm one, which is a close enough replacement in this case. Okay, now I measure 22 ohm. Let's give it another shot. Yes, the compact flashcard was detected. Now we could theoretically try to boot into DOS. However, the keyboard is still dead. Obviously the disk detection issue was not related. What is actually a good sign, because so far a defect in the south bridge was not the reason for not working hard drive. I have an idea, let's try to use a USB keyboard and see if that works. And it does, USB is also part of the south bridge logic, so this is another sign that the south bridge is probably okay. But the PS2 keyboard is connected directly to the south bridge, so what could it be? Theoretically, I could just ignore PS2 and use a USB keyboard, but the way how USB works, it adds a lot of latency and potentially can significantly slow down the whole system. So on machines of that time, using USB keyboard and mouse was not the best idea. But the keyboard does work through USB, so we can make more tests and try to boot into DOS. First of all, let's uh, do some BIOS settings and get rid of that error message. As always, let's set the time and disable the floppy port to speed up the boot process. Also, we would need to enable USB support to have a working keyboard in DOS. And the system did boot in DOS. That's a huge step. I have another idea which could help to analyze the problem with the keyboard. There is a second PS2 port on this board which is for the mouse. Let's connect a PS2 mouse and try to load a mouse driver in DOS to see if that one works. If the mouse works, that would be another hint that the south bridge is alright. 
I'm sure PS2 mouse and keyboard share some parts internally, so if one works, the other should potentially work as well. And the PS2 mouse has been detected. Interesting. Luckily, on the RetroWeb, there is already documentation for the ALI M1543C available. Let's take a look at that and see what it tells about the keyboard controller inside. The problem about the BGA chips like M1543 is that the solder joints are under the chip and you can't easily measure anything directly at the chip, so you see the keyboard clock and data pins are almost in the middle of the chip and it's hard to tell if the traces under the chip have a proper connection. Let's see what the documentation says about the keyboard signals. Here, the related pin can be either keyboard clock or ISA latched address bus line 21, or general purpose input. That's interesting. Look at this. Uh, this pin is the keyboard's interface clock when internal keyboard controller is enabled and hotkey function is disabled. RTS to J is pulled high and PCSJ is pulled high. That is very interesting. So the related pins are obviously configurable. Hotkey is a feature to turn on the system by pressing a key on the keyboard. Please see 5.4.1. Okay, let's take a look. So, here we have hotkey function implementation. And here we have two schematics how a keyboard can be connected to the south bridge. This main board has a jumper which allows to power the keyboard in standby to be able to wake up the system by pressing a key. So I would say this board implements the hotkey feature. The interesting part is this resistor which tells the south bridge how the keyboard is to be connected. In case of hotkey feature support, there have to be somewhere a pull down resistor around the south bridge. So, I went through all of the parts around the south bridge and searched for the resistors which are connected to the ground and could be potentially the pull-down resistor we are searching for. And after some poking around I found something. Do you remember this mess? This is a resistor network which I previously cleaned and where two resistors are connected to the ground on one side and with another to the traces which disappear under the south bridge. So I tested this resistor network and it turned out that the second resistor shows infinite resistance. In other words, it's basically dead. Let's remove it and replace with another one. First I was a bit confused by its value of 195, which would mean 190 kilo ohm. That doesn't make a lot of sense. A weak pull down resistor has usually a value between 4.7 and 10 kilo ohm. A strong pull down would have like 1 kilo ohm or less. Then I realized my funny confusion. That's not 195, but rather 561, which means 560 ohm. In my spare parts I didn't have a 560 ohm replacement, so I took 330 ohm, which would pull even stronger down, but in this case, once again, it should be good enough replacement. Now let's give it another try. And would you look at that, the keyboard has been detected. What a relief. That culprit was not the south bridge or any corroded traces underneath. Luckily it was a simple pull down resistor. Nice. All issues which surfaced so far could be fixed. The system boots from the compact flashcard, 
and the keyboard works as well. I guess the exposed traces can be now tinted to enforce those a little bit. To get the solder more evenly onto the copper, it's easier to polish the traces first. I will also cover the traces with a nail varnish to protect those from further oxidation. Ok, before doing some tests, let's also update the BIOS to the latest version. Previously version 1006 was used, now I will go all in with the latest beta 1011.005 version. Very nice, the board is still working and the BIOS has been updated to the latest version. Let's boot into DOS and make some tests. Well, everything seems to run stable so far. Without any bias tweaking, the system made about 100 FPS in Doom, 65 FPS in Quake and finished speed seize tests with reasonable values. But the most important thing is that it seems to run stable so far. Nice. One interesting thing which I would like to test now is another CPU. You see, on the retro web there has been told that due to a hardware problem of P5A in revision 1.05 and 1.06, it will work extremely slow with a K6 Plus CPUs. Those are K6 2 Plus and K6 3 Plus. The revision of the boards which I have is the 104. And I would like to check if this one would show any signs of slowing down when using a K6 Plus CPUs. I have here an AMD K6 2 Plus 550, but I will leave the multiplier settings as they are, so the CPU will continue to run at 450 MHz. I'm curious to see if there will be any slowdowns, and if not, then we can compare a K62 against K62 Plus clock for clock on this board. Let's give it a try. I'll just set the voltage down to 2 volts as required by the CPU to avoid any unneeded stress on it. And so far so good, the CPU has been detected as a proper K62 Plus 450. Let's again run some benchmarks. Ok, I couldn't measure any slowdown. The K62 Plus did not run slower than the K62 at the same clock. That's good news. The not quite so good news is that the K62 Plus was barely faster than the normal K62 as well. In Doom it was about 3% improvement, in Quake with 70 FPS it was around 7%. In Speed Seas the performance difference was barely measurable. But the good thing is that on this board the onboard cache works as level 3 cache with a K6 Plus CPU. That is something good and in some applications that can give a small benefit as well. But once again on this revision 1.04 of the ASUS P5A mainboard K6 Plus seems to work fine and without any slowdowns. Now if this board is fast, well it's not bad, but how good it is that is something what I leave up to you to decide. Maybe you want to take a look at the results of the 
Asus SP97V from my last video. That one doesn't have AGP, doesn't support SDRAM, and doesn't support 100 MHz frontside bus, and though it delivers quite competitive results. But still, Asus P5A is a legendary and one of the best SuperSocket 7 mainboards, especially the earlier revisions are reported to be good if you want to use K6 Plus CPUs. This board was in awful condition, nasty corrosion all over the place, damaged traces, not working IDE ports, not working keyboard, all kind of issues, but eventually I would say this board can be considered as resurrected now, and it will hopefully do the job in some retro DOS and Windows 98 gaming machine. Not only does it support a very wide range of CPUs, AGP, PCI and ISA cards, it also can be slowed down to run very old, speed-sensitive DOS games, and since it has an ATX form factor, it is very easy to find a case and a PSU for it. I'm happy that this board is back to life, thanks to Matt for passing this over to me. I hope you enjoyed this repair as well, and would be very glad about your feedback. As always, thank you for watching, and goodbye.